A thorough and comprehensive understanding of cardiac morphology is essential when understanding the pathological features of congenital cardiac defects. Congenital heart disease can vary hugely anywhere from transposition of the great arteries to a functional univentricular heart or even coarctation of the aorta. In each of these cases, cardiac morphology underpins the pathological development of these lesions and must be considered when evaluating patients with these conditions. In today's tutorial, I'll be taking you through the fundamentals of cardiac morphology by considering each of the morphological components of the heart using sequential segmental analysis. My name's Aisha and welcome to Anatomy 101. The first approach used to describe cardiac morphology was introduced by the internationally recognised paediatric cardiologist Richard van Prague in 1985. He proposed a segment-by-segment -segment approach which categorises the heart into three cardiac segments, the atriums, the ventricles and the arterial trunks. With improvements in technology such as advanced 3D imaging in recent years, this system was amended by Professor Anderson, an esteemed cardiac anatomist who described cardiac morphology according to the cardiac segments but also the atrioventricular junctions and the ventricular arterial junctions. When we describe the morphology of the heart, it is the most constant morphological feature which we must consider. Before we start, it's important to remember that cardiac morphology must be analysed when the heart is in the attitudinally correct position, that is, when the heart is positioned as it would be within the body. Ok, let's start off by considering the atriums. As mentioned in our last tutorial, the atriums are comprised of five main components, including the atrial body, the septal surface, the atrial appendage, the venous component and the atrial vestibule. Of these structures, the atrial appendage is the most constant morphological feature and is the feature used to distinguish between the morphologically right atrium and the morphologically left atrium. The morphologically right atrium is characterised by a broad-based and triangular atrial appendage with an extensive distribution of pectinate muscle, whilst the morphologically left atrium is characterised by a narrow and tubular atrial appendage with pectinate muscle confined solely within the appendage. As a result, we find pectinate muscle all around the right atrium, whereas no pectinate muscle can be seen outside the appendage in the left atrium. Due to these differences between the left and right atrial appendages, we can classify the atriums into one of four atrial arrangements. The first of which is known as usual atrial arrangement, or cytosolitis in Latin, where the right atrial appendage is on the right and the left atrial appendage is on the left. The second is mirror-imaged atrial appendages, otherwise known as situs inversus. Just as its name implies, this presents when the right atrial appendage is now on the left and the left atrial appendage is now on the right. Next, we have left atrial appendage isomerism, where both atriums are of left-type morphology, with the left atrial appendages on both the left and right sides of the septum. The fourth and final atrial arrangement is right atrial appendage isomerism, where both atriums are of right type, with the morphologically right atrial appendages on both the left and right sides of the septum. When considering atrial isomerism, which can sometimes be referred to as heterotaxy, it's worth knowing that isomerism can be seen in other asymmetrical organs of the body. In this image demonstrating right atrial appendage isomerism, we can see both lungs resemble the right lung as each lung possesses three lobes. These patients can also present with absence of a spleen. On the other hand, left atrial appendage isomerism can often present with lungs which both resemble the left lung due to the presence of two lobes. Interestingly, these patients often have multiple spleens known as polysplenia. Okay, now we've covered the morphology surrounding the atriums, let's now consider the ventricles. Each ventricle is comprised of an inlet which supports the atrioventricular valves, an apical component containing muscular trabeculations, and an outlet component which supports either the aortic or pulmonary valves. Of these three ventricular components, the apical trabecular component, which sits between the inlet and outlet, is the most constant morphological feature of the ventricles and is the strongest criterion used to distinguish between the morphologically left ventricle and the morphologically right ventricle. If we first consider the morphologically right ventricle, as seen in this image, where I've reflected the right ventricular wall inferiorly, we can see that the right ventricle contains very coarse trabeculations, which can even appear as large chunks of muscle in some individuals. 
In contrast, the morphologically left ventricle, as seen in this image, contains fine crisscross tuberculations, which are much more intricate than the right ventricle. Before we move on, it's worth knowing that alongside distinguishing between the right and left ventricles, morphologists also consider the way in which the ventricles are related to the ventricular mass. We call this ventricular topology, which essentially checks to see if the right ventricle is on the correct side. Ventricular topology is typically detected by placing one's right hand on the surface of the morphologically right ventricle. In the normal heart, the palmar surface would be in contact with the ventricular septum, the thumb will be directed towards the inlet, and the fingers in the outlet. We call this configuration right hand ventricular topology and is considered to be normal. Some hearts, on the other hand, can actually present with left hand ventricular topology, which is abnormal. In these cases, Instead of the right hand being used, one's left hand is placed on the surface of the right ventricle such that the palmar surface is applied to the septum, the thumb in the inlet and fingers in the outlet. Now we've covered the ventricles, let's consider the atrioventricular junctions which connect the atriums to the ventricles. The atrioventricular junctions or AV junctions contain atrioventricular orifices which guard the mitral and tricuspid valves. Importantly, an AV junction can be patent where an atrium is connected to an underlying ventricle, absent where one of the atriums is not connected to the underlying ventricle due to fibrofatty tissue, or imperforate, where the AV junction develops but is blocked by an imperforate valvar membrane. It's also worth mentioning that the morphology of the AV junction is considered independent and irrespective to the morphology of the valves or ventricular topology. The atrioventricular junctions can be broadly divided into either biventricular or univentricular AV junctions. In very rare cases, an AV junction can be described as uniatrial and biventricular, but we'll cover this in a later session. Biventricular AV connections develop when each AV valve drains into one underlying ventricle to produce a biventricular circulation. In this image, we can see two ventricular chambers separated by a ventricular septum. On the other hand, the AV junctions can also be univentricular, where either one or both of the AV junctions are connected to one dominant ventricle, as seen in this image. Although the term univentricular would suggest the presence of only one ventricle, most hearts considered univentricular do in fact possess two ventricles, however the second ventricle is often hyperplastic and considerably smaller. In these patients, almost the entirety of the body's blood supply is supplied by a single ventricle to produce a univentricular circulation. Ok, let's apply our knowledge on the patterns of atrial arrangement to take a closer look at the different types of biventricular AV connections. The first type of biventricular AV junctions is that which is shown in these two hearts. In the first heart, we can see the right atrial appendage is on the right and the left atrial appendage is on the left which would in turn produce a usual atrial arrangement. In the second heart, we can see the right atrial appendage is now on the left, and the left atrial appendage is now on the right, which describes mirror-imaged atrial appendages. If we consider the ventricular mass connecting each of these atriums, we find that in both hearts, the morphologically right atrium is connected to the morphologically right ventricle. We also see the morphologically left atriums are also connected to the morphologically left ventricles. As each atrium is connected to the correct underlying ventricle, we call this group of hearts concordant atrioventricular connections. In the second type of biventricular AV junctions, we see that like in the first group, one heart possesses usual atrial arrangement and the second heart has mirror imaged atrial appendages. What makes this group different to concordant AV connections is that now in both hearts, the morphologically right atriums are now connected to the morphologically left ventricles and the morphologically left atriums are now connected to the morphologically right ventricles. As each atrium is now connected to its incorrect underlying ventricle, we call this group as having discordant atrioventricular connections. In the next type of AV junctions, we see both hearts possess right atrial appendage isomerism, where the right atrial appendage is present on both left and right sides of the septum. In this case, one right atrium is connected to an underlying morphologically right ventricle, and the other right atrium is connected to an underlying morphologically left ventricle. This pattern can also be seen in these hearts, which both have left atrial appendage isomerism. Just like the hearts before, one left atrium is connected to an underlying morphologically left ventricle, and the other left atrium is connected to an underlying morphologically right ventricle. 
we describe these hearts as having biventricular and mixed AV junctions, which form the third and final group of biventricular AV connections. For completeness, let's also briefly cover univentricular AV connections. There are three types of univentricular AV junctions. The first type are those with an absent right AV connection, where the right atrium is not connected to its underlying ventricle. The second type are hearts with a double inlet AV connection, where blood from both AV connections are draining into one dominant ventricle, as shown in this image. The third and final group are those with an absent left AV connection, where the left atrium is not connected to its underlying ventricle due to the presence of fibro fatty tissue. Before we move on, it's worth mentioning that a univentricular junction can present with either a dominant left ventricle, a dominant right ventricle, or a solitary indeterminate ventricle, whose trabeculations does not resemble either the left or right ventricles. Okay, that's the trickier concepts out the way, let's cover the morphology of the arterial trunks. The arterial trunks are the third and final cardiac segment, which include the aorta and pulmonary artery. Unlike the atriums and ventricles, there are no intrinsic morphological features that can distinguish between the aorta and pulmonary trunk. Instead, we use the arterial branching pattern, such as the presence of coronary arteries in the aorta or branches of the pulmonary artery to distinguish between the two. This in turn creates four possible types of arterial trunks. The first is the aorta and the second is the pulmonary trunk. These first two are seen in the normal heart where both the aorta and pulmonary artery are identified separately. The third pattern describes a common arterial trunk where both ventricles are connected to a single trunk by a common arterial valve. This gives rise to coronary arteries and at least one pulmonary artery. The fourth type of arterial trunk is a solitary arterial trunk where the proximal aspect of the pulmonary trunk is absent and cannot be identified within the pericardial cavity. This leads on nicely to the final component of sequential segmental analysis, which is the ventricular arterial junctions. The ventricular arterial or VA junctions are defined as the connection between the ventricles and the arterial trunks. These typically support the aortic and pulmonary valves. There are four types of ventricular arterial junctions to be aware of. The first are concordant VA junctions, where the left ventricle gives rise to the aorta and the right ventricle gives rise to the pulmonary trunk. This represents the normal pattern seen in the normal heart. The second category of ventricular arterial junctions are discordant VA junctions, where this time the morphologically left ventricle is now giving rise to the pulmonary trunk and the right ventricle is now giving rise to the aorta. The third type is double outlet ventricular arterial connections, where both arteries, the aorta and pulmonary trunk, arise from the same ventricle. This can arise from the morphologically left ventricle, a right ventricle, or an indeterminate ventricle. The final type of ventricular arterial junction is the single outlet VA connections, where as its name suggests there is only one main arterial trunk. This arrangement can present as one of four patterns. The first of which are single outlet aortic atresia, where the pulmonary trunk is present but the aorta is atretic and underdeveloped. The second is a single outlet pulmonary atresia, where the aorta is present but the pulmonary trunk is atretic and underdeveloped. The third is a common arterial trunk, where blood crosses a common arterial valve to form a trunk which gives rise to coronary arteries and at least one pulmonary artery branch. And the fourth is a solitary trunk, where the proximal pulmonary artery is absent. Okay, now we've covered the morphology of the cardiac and junctional segments, let's wrap up by considering two final morphological components to ensure a comprehensive and complete description of cardiac morphology. Alongside analysing the heart using sequential segmental analysis, the position of the heart within the thorax should also be considered. This image presents a schematic illustration of the thorax, and if I remove the thoracic wall and pleura, we can see the heart is positioned within the left hemithorax. This is the normal positioning of the heart, which is termed levocardia. In some cases, the heart may be positioned within the right hemithorax instead of the left, resulting in dextrocardia. Alternatively, the heart can be positioned within the middle of the thoracic cavity, resulting in mesocardia. The final point to consider to complete our morphological analysis of the heart is the position of the cardiac apex. The cardiac apex may be positioned to the left, which represents the normal and commonly observed arrangement, however the apex can also be orientated towards the midline or even towards the right. And there we go, that's everything there is to say about the morphology of the heart, 
the cardiac segments, as well as the atrioventricular and ventricular arterial junctions using sequential segmental analysis. If you enjoyed this session, remember to give this video a like and subscribe to our channel and leave a comment down below with what you'd like to see us cover next. Thank you for listening and have a great day.